Hello and welcome to this video about the champion programs we're running for assisted movement and handling. Now, whether you're a trained trainer, whether you've done movement and handling before, which I'm sure you have because you wouldn't be doing this otherwise, um, or this may be your first time in delving into this topic uh, to the level and breadth we're going to, I can absolutely assure you now you are going to learn loads. And I say that because I recently completed a four and a half day programme with Sutton County Council with an instructor called Sally. And being a mental health nurse, being in the job for 25 years, I thought, what am I going to learn from this? I can't believe I'm on a four and a half day course <laughs> for this. And it was the most interesting course that I have sat on for years because I walked away with so much more knowledge than I had before. And the penny dropped on lots of things. And I learned more in those four and a half days for movement and handling than I had through my whole entire nursing um, degree. So I really want you to kind of park any preconceptions about what you think you know around movement and handling and I want you to kind of just really listen, look at what I'm going to be showing you so you can really understand how it all comes together because it does go together like a jigsaw. Now on the screen, you're going to see two things. You're going to see the Canvas uh, app and, and that's where everything's built. Uh, and on the other side, I'm going to show you paperwork and things. Uh, and that's because I'm going to have two screens going uh, side by side. So you can kind of see when I'm pointed to things, what it is we're talking about and why. But before we do that, let's just look at the Canvas side. So when you look in, you've got your welcome and introductions. So in there, there's three videos, which you will have seen probably a thousand times, uh, and the PowerPoint. Now, the PowerPoint has about 150 something slides in that. That is your bog standard moving and handling train the trainer presentation. So it runs, it runs through the theories, the background, the laws, the legislations. And then what I've got uh, underneath are videos that I purchased from um, Mulberry House, and that's the theory, the practical, and assessments for movement and handling. So if you're going to support a new member of staff, that's kind of it, then you would do your competencies. However, if you're moving up through the ranks, you're going to be more senior, um, and you're going to be assessing patients or you're going to be uh, getting more involved in training the trainer modules etc then obviously you carry on so you need to know this plus everything else so we then go through understanding key concepts of moving and handling so again just a bit more in detail about legislations risks etc so just pulling up a bit more off of those videos and a little bit more understanding around the anatomy and physiology. So understanding why we do what we do uh, and about that uh, curve of, of the spine, etc., and what we should be looking for. Where it starts to really pick up, and this is what this video is going to concentrate on, is understanding risk assessments and risk assessment tools. So again, that's what's on the page here. And we're going to run through the evidence-based practices. So as a practitioner, we are clearly evidence-based. We're not going to say it's this because I think so. It's going to be it's this because the evidence says. And we're going to run through each of those things. So it's really important if you've never done this before that you don't skip this, that you do pay particular attention to each box here. Because each box here that you can see on the screen links directly to that risk assessment form. So every question asked in there, the breadth and depth of the detail of that understanding is on this page. So it's really important you understand what it is you're saying. Furthermore, and again, I only learned this not that long ago, um, there are two things that you really should know. One is the National Back Exchange. So I've given you a link to the National Back Exchange and you can join up as a member um, and, and subscribe as an individual. And in there, it gives you an opportunity to network with other people that work with moving and handling. Um, and th there's an app on your phone that you can download. And it's a great resource for just 
posing those questions. So if you're assessing people and you're not sure, and you've just got one of those really tricky service users, post it in there. And then finally on there, you can see that you've got the HOP7. Now, the HOP7 is the national standards, if you like, for moving and handling. So it's where all of the train trainer theories and practical bits come from. Uh, and obviously, it's evidence based. So it's important as a champion or as a trainer trainer for moving and handling that you have got a copy of the HOP7. So uh, we've obviously ordered them for uh, organisations that we're working with. So please make sure that you do access your HOP7. If you haven't got a HOP7, I highly recommend that you buy it because in there it gives you wonderful pictures and updates about uh, different things uh, that we should and shouldn't be doing around moving and handling. Uh, and then finally, um, what we then have is some practical elements. So I've listed all the practical elements uh, here and you've got um, your biomechanicals and principles of lifting. So from having your squash, your stable base, your, your just basic stuff. And really level one, uh, the practice skills level one is for everyone. It doesn't matter who you are in an organization, you should all do practical skills one, because that's from picking up a box to just, you know, maintaining that stable base and keeping your back nice and straight. Then we start to look at your care skills. So if you are working in health and social care, if you're assessing, if you're looking to support people, these then are the skills uh, for checking how to support somebody from sitting to standing, checking their weight bearing, uh, the one person assistance and using those recliners, etc. We then have mobility assessment. So that's uh, going up and down the stairs moving from a chair to a commode and then using a bath seat. So there's some videos there for you to watch uh, on those as well. Then we've got uh, using small hand grenades. So using uh, frames. Then we've got standing aids. So again, different types of standing aids there from the molar um, and stand aid. Uh, and again, uh, these are videos directly from the manufacturers as well. Um, then we've got in-bed care, so we're going to look at kind of those uh, Wendy Let sheets, the slide sheets, um, so assisted moving up and down the bed um, and your four-way glides. Um, we're going to be looking at vehicles, getting an access of a vehicle transfer, so turning, etc., those wheelchairs. We'll look at preventing falls, so again... Um, understand about falls, your falls histories, uh, looking at what it is we would be doing there uh, and, and how we're going to support. How we assist somebody to fall. So we're going to look at how you assist somebody to fall. We're going to look at assisting a falling person, uh, then using a hoist. Now, equally, through the practical sessions that you'll have, I'm also going to show you additional things. So I'm going to show you how to use a fisherman's kit. So that's the, for the legs. We're going to show you how to use gloves. Um, so kind of for repositioning in the bed, how you can just use a sliding guard to reposition somebody in a chair. Love Sally for that one. It's the best move you're, you're going to learn. Um, so there's going to be additional stuff that we're going to show around this, including... Um, how we can use those assistive movement handling techniques from going from two carers down to one. And we'll talk about that because I know what you're thinking. Oh, it's all about reducing care packages. It's all about trying to do this. Uh, and in some ways, yes, because the whole point of promoting independence and reliance is about reducing packages and having those outcomes. But again, we'll only do it if it's safe to do because we need to have that outcome. And we'll do it in line with the evidence. So again, as we go through the My Handling uh, Assessment Plan, we'll talk about how we could reduce packages safely with the right equipment and with the right assessment tools. Good. So I'm going to scroll back up. That's just the overview of, of everything there. And I'm going to go back to understanding risks. Now, in here, the first thing you're going to look at is when you click on here, is a copy of the My Hand and Assessment Plan. And what I've done is I've gone through this in red 
for you to think about how you're going to answer stuff. Okay, so where you're going to get the evidence from. Because the one thing that I got told off for, and I don't mind sharing because it's all about lessons learned, is apparently I write too much. Now, I know what you're thinking, those that know me, you're in shock, horror, and in complete disbelief. However, it is true. Um, so my one takeaway, not my one takeaway, but my many of my one takeaways from this training was about reducing the amount we write without compromising the quality. Uh, and we can reduce the amount we write if we are using evidence-based practices, because then we can just summarise some of the bits and pieces. So... For example, as you can see on here, um, and I'm going to run through it on this side now, we've got our name, our date of birth and our normal information there, uh, and then our diagnosis uh, here, so what we know about. Now, straight away, alarm bell should be ringing around cognitive impairments, service users that have had strokes, service users that have had any M uh, MSK stuff, musculoskeletus problems, um, service users that, that have um, maybe got dementia where things can be a little bit harder for us to understand, or even service users that have got um, a history of eating disorders and things like that, because again, if someone's had an eating disorder, their uh, skin integrity, et cetera, is going to be a lot worse. And again, anyone with osteoarthritis or any of those arthritis is we need to know about. So just a bit of information there. Straight away, we need to know BMI weight and height. And that's because if you're going to go up to the trusted assessor model where you start prescribing equipment, or indeed, if you've got equipment in front of you, you need to know that you have the right equipment for the right individual. So again, things like the hoist, have weight checks on. The slings will have certain sizes. The equipment is designed for certain people and certain builds. So it's really important that we collect that uh, information. Now, being a nurse, if we've got all of that information, we might as well do the MUSC score. And the MUSC score is your malnutrition score. So that gives us an idea of the level of um, malnutrition this individual might be having. Now, if you've never done the must before, it's very simple. You can go to Google uh, and you've got your must scores all up there. Now, I like using MedPlusCamp. It's the one that's, that's in the um, training that I've given you. And that's because it gives you a really simple care plan that you can cut and paste across. So let's just say um, my BMI is above 20. Um, yeah, let's say it's above 20. Um, I've had some unplanned weight loss in the last three to six months. Um, is the patient ill that has been likely to be in one for less than five days? Let's go, yes. And here you go, you can see it comes up with the score. So in here, you can write high risk. And if you wanted to, you can even copy your results and go to next steps. And there's your next steps and your management plan. Now, I appreciate the fact that this is about nutrition and diet. But if we think about skin integrity, when we move somebody, there's a process called shearing. So if the skin is dehydrated, it's just going to peel. So as you move somebody, you could potentially shear them and their skin is just going to roll up and flake. If we can keep the hydration in the skin and we can keep the fatty tissues going, it's going to make them less risk to pressure sores and shearing. So again, knowing that information, really useful um, because it gives you an idea that you should be doing something to promote better skin care okay wonderful so that's your must scores um then what we've got as we come down here it then goes straight away it says um can the person cooperate or communicate with you yes no there if yes please specify well it should be even if no please specify um 
And you can see here, I've put, you need to think about the accessible information standards. Okay, so what are the accessible information standards? Where does this come from? So in here, you will see that I have got understanding accessible information standards. And in there, we talk about what the CQC requirements are about us producing a plan that the individual can understand. So this plan is beautiful. It's a wonderful plan. It, 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 it's going to really help us and the individual and the family members understand what it is we're going to do to assist and move this individual. However, if it's not in their language, if they can't understand it, if it's too complex, the plan isn't going to work. So we need to make sure that if we have somebody with a communication barrier, that we are creating plans that the individual or the family members can understand. Because if not, what is the point? So please make sure that before you conduct your assessments, you've got two things under your belt. Does the individual have capacity? And have you got somebody in the room that understands capacity? Uh, or maybe the next of kin for health and welfare? Um, and two, uh, do you know the preferred method of communication? Because if, so let's say for example, they're Portuguese, how much of this are you gonna get across to them and how much are they gonna understand? So ultimately, should we be looking at adaptations, translations or translators? Good. Then it goes on and it says, uh, does the patient have any cognitive or behavior issues? Yes, no. Again, if yes, let us know. So here, we're going to need to understand the RRN standards around the restraint reduction network standards. And that's because if we're working with an individual who has got challenging or hazardous behavior, so let's make sure we understand the difference between the two. Challenging behaviour is I'm going to just call you some names. I'm going to just make your life really uncomfortable by probably just screaming and shouting and just being challenging. Hazardous behaviour is very different. That's where a potential I can bite you, scratch you, kick you, spit at you. So I'm going to call some physical harm. If there is a chance that I'm going to cause you physical harm whilst performing a moving and handling task, then you need to have a behaviour support plan. Because what we must be able to do is manage that behaviour to reduce the risk of harm to the staff before we conduct anything. And again, in behaviour support plans, we may be looking at models of positive behaviour support. So looking at reinforcement, looking at ways of managing the behaviour. Or alternatively, we may have to escalate that up to um, low level restraints. And what we mean by low level of restraints is if I'm laying in the bed and I'm kicking you, if you just place the back of your hand on my ankle, I can't lift my leg up. If that blocks the kick, that's absolutely appropriate as long as there's a behaviour support plan. If I'm punching out at you, you can hold the back of my hand just like that. You can just put a block over the back of my hand and then I can't lift my hand up. If I'm scratching you, you could perhaps just close my hand as long as I haven't got uh, osteoarthritis in my hands or maybe give me a ball to hold and then you can just grip my hand like that so I'm not scratching you. Uh, or again, alternatively, we've got those moving hand and gloves. We could just put a sleeve on them and that would stop them scratching you. So there are things that we can do to assist in the moving and handling to ensure the care staff are not being assaulted whilst performing this task. Because if, this, if the staff are care, scared of getting hurt, then we already put a risk in the moving and handling which shouldn't be there. So we need to make sure that that assessment's been done. Uh, good. Then we're going to look at uh, pain. So does the individual have pain? Now, again, thinking about accessible information, thinking about the way that they communicate, they may not be able to tell you, but you could just do a pain scale. So, Bob, I'm just about to put this on. Can you tell me, are you in pain? You know, if you point on one of those faces, whereabouts are you? OK, you, you hit five, so you're in moderate pain. If I adjust it and do this, where are you now on that pain scale? A one. Great. OK, so I can see that that technique is far better for you on pain. Or alternatively, you might use the pain scale. In, but when you wake up in the morning, where are you on that pain scale? You're up at a 10. 
fine. So the refer the last thing you're going to want is me pushing and pulling you. Do we have a care plan in place to reduce that pain down to at least moderate pain before we start shifting you around? Um, you know, and if that's yes, maybe that's the medication. Now, ultimately, I know what you're going to be saying to me, but if we've only got a half hour uh, time slot, how are we going to be doing medications to reduce uh, pain, etc.? Well, ultimately, then that's down to us to think about different techniques to manage that risk. And that may be that we call Bob 15, 20 minutes before the call and say, Bob, I'm on my way. Can you just take your pain relief before I get there? Or family member, I'm going to come around shortly. Can you put some of um, the ibuprofen creams on, diprofenac creams, whatever it is, on the joints to loosen the joints up before we start? So there may be a pre-care plan before the movement and handling takes place. So just think about those pain scales. And again, great evidence and great evidence for outcomes. So if you adjust the ways of working because the pain scale is high, it gives you a proper score in which you can work with. So again, in here, just write the pain scale score. AM pain, 10. After medication goes down to a five. At this level, it's okay to move. Um, suggested this movement, pain scale was at six. We adjusted it, pain scale now one. Perfect, great reasoning for why we're address adjusting something. Good. We then need to know, does the person have any attachments? So are there things like catheters, stomacytes, or anything like that? So again, if there are, we need to know about them because again, we need to think about if there's a catheter bag on, how do we incorporate that in the moving the handling plan, which is further down. Good, so when we move over and we're going to look at medications, so does the patient or person take any medication that affects the movement? So not that long ago, I looked at this with another patient and it said the patient was in severe pain, but then the patient didn't have any medication. I thought, well, that's a bit weird. Um, so if you're marking high on pain, then obviously why aren't we looking at medication as a way of managing pain? So in here, I've obviously given you the information about certain medications that can affect movement. So looking at how we look at muscle relaxations, pain medications, um, anti-convulsion anti medications and sedations, etc. So just a little bit of awareness around certain medications and what they do to the body before we start uh, moving and handling patients. Moving on then, we look at skin and tissue viability problems. Um, so are there tissue or skin viability problems? Again, you've done the muscle, so we'll have an idea if, if the patient's um, dehydrated. But what we're looking at here is the risk of pressure sores, the risk of um, ulcers. So again here, we've got the Waterloo score. So the Waterloo score looks at our risk. It's a general scoring system. It's been used for a very long time in health and social care. And again, you tick everything off. So again, here, look, you need to know your BMI. So another reason to know the BMI, the skin type, the um, sex, uh, weight loss. So again, you can see how this kind of goes into knowing weights, uh, the score, the nutrition score. So again, that's going back to that muscle. Uh, at, then you're looking at your um, continence, mobility and other risks. And then ultimately, you total up all those scores and that gives you an overall score. Now, if the score comes up high, so, you know, if we're at a 10 plus, then we need to be doing a referral to the tissue viability team because something's not right. Um, have we got the right continence plan in place? Have we got the right assistive moving equipment? Have we got the right pressure relief? Are we doing the right skincare techniques? So again, just thinking about some of the things we can do to manage that skin to integrity um, as we're going through. Good. So we then move on. Uh, does the person have a history of falls? So again, um, if they have a history of falls, we need to know about it. But equally, what is the risk and where are you getting that risk from? So here we have the FRAT assessment tool for risk of falls. And again, 
very simple assessment tool here. If you put yes, you get a score. And then here, three to five is high risks, uh, lower than that is low. So we just need what it is. And obviously, if you're writing then yes, they are at risk to falls, then you are going to need a falls assessment. So what is it you're going to do to reduce that risk in the future? So have you got things such as sensor mats and then you've got hip protectors or are they on one-to-one -one observations? What is it you're going to do to manage that risk to make sure it's safe? And then finally there, you're looking at, um, does the person have any problems with spasms and muscles? So again, kind of thinking about things like maybe Parkinson's. So um, are you having to be there half an hour before to make sure the medication's given on time? Are you gonna have to do any hand massages just to loosen the joints or whatever it is you're gonna be doing to so those care routines. So those factors gives us a huge amount of information and actually, we don't need to write a lot in there. We just need to write scores with a little bit of justification of what we did so we understand them. Wonderful. We then move on to what we all commonly know as a risk assessment. And we know in risk assessments, we have the identified task, the level of risk or the potential to cause harm. And then we look at what it is and how we're going to manage that risk. And on here, you can see we've got the task on the left hand side. We then have green for low, yellow for medium, red for high. Now, ultimately, you're going to be ticking these boxes. But I don't want you to tick the box because that's what you think is the level of risk. I want you to tick the box because you have done a proper assessment using the FIM score. And the FIM score looks at uh, the, the risk, the severity and the likelihood of harm. And once you've considered all of that, it will then give you a result, a number. And that's what I want you to put, FIM score. I want you to put the number in the comments and then you can tick whether it's low, medium or high. So I'll show you this. So on here, if we go to this side, you can see that you've got your FIM score there. I've given you a little bit of write up on it. So here we look at the level of dependency. Now this is important because some of the equipment that we use or is prescribed, it will have a FIM score. It will say you must have a FIM score of three or more or whatever. So here, meaning they need moderate assistance and they're able to do um, up to 50 to 75% of the effort. So whatever that is, the, we need to assess that level. And then what we're going to do, as we scroll down for the FIM score, we're going to look at step one, now look at step one, which is the likelihood. So for example, the patient person can lift legs independently. So let's say I can't lift my legs that well. What is the likelihood of there being a problem there? So again, we're going to have a look at that well, let's, you know, let's say we say there's maybe possible sometimes. Fine. OK, so we've got a three. But we're then going to look at the severity of the problems. Well, OK, I can lift my legs. I, you know, I've got a foot, um, like a dog lead for my leg. So I'm able to lift it up and put it down. I haven't got no control. I have got some control. So it's not likely I'm going to injure myself. Um, so here, really... I haven't got any injury. I'm not going to do anything that, that's going to hurt myself. Um, and there's no risk or impact to the organisation. So maybe, it, you know, or it probably is more to actually. It's unlikely it's going to happen with a real insignificant. So I've got a two and then a one. So I've got a two here. And then I go along to one. And that gives me a 2L. So in here, I would write 2L because, or whatever it is, Stephen's able to lift his legs independently. He has good muscle control. Fine. And you can see then it's low risk. So I can then clearly 
mark that box because it's not my opinion it's the film score that's caused that judgment okay so that's how you're going to go through that using the film score now as we move on through the assessment, it then looks at the environment. So is this a micro environment? Is it a one place? You know, is it downstairs, upstairs? So wherever care is given, they're different environments. We need to make sure that we have an assessment in each environment. Equally, we need to look at uh, other people providing care. So for example, here, is there another person involved? And if there are, have they been assessed? So here, you know, if we're looking at spouse or a carer or a neighbour, have they done the informal care of suitability been done? And if we go to our risk assessment tools, if we go on our risk stuff, um, and we go to, oh no, hang on, and we go to, let's go back, and we go to risk assessments, and then here you've got your informal checklist. So again, has the informal checklist been done, making sure that this person is suitable to help us? And if, it, and if they are suitable to help us, have we then done the training form? So have they then done the training? So have we then done the competencies with them? Okay, so again, they should receive exactly the same training. They could log in, they could do this online training as well. I've got no problems with that, you know, just the first module. Um, and again, we should be working with them to understand uh, the, their training needs. Um, but equally, uh, we need to make sure that they've been given the right resources. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So here then, tasks requiring a handling plan. So now from the above, which ones do we now need to do the plan for? And that's because we've probably marked it medium or high. So if we've marked it medium or high, what are we going to do about it? Now, when we mark things medium or high in the rationale, we can ask the residents, we can ask the staff, we could ask, um, let's say, for example, we've got two carers and they go, look, Steve, it's just, you know, I don't know, let's say a uh, position in bed. Well, it's unlike the first one's going to be. But anyway, we've got position in bed. We're saying it's a high risk. It's come up as a high risk. And the carers say to me, well, look, we've been doing this and it's just really, really hard work. So at this point, I need to know, when you tell me it's hard work, what do you mean by that? And for this, we have the Borg scale. So this is the level of exertion that the staff are experienced. So here we can say to the member of staff, well, look, OK, so we're going to do a movement handling plan because you're saying this is really, really hard. So we could do Borg score, so Borg score, I don't know, nine. Fine, great reason to, to do that. Great justification to do it. And then what we would hope is we would put the plan in place and then we'd go back and we'd say, right, now, OK, you do this task. How do you find that task now? And they would go, oh, it's a three. Good. You know, what we're looking for is anything below four. Nothing should be hard. Ideally, all of the equipment we use should make the job really easy or easy. Um, now, when we've got two carers, and this is what we talk about doubling up or going down to one carer, when we have two carers, we would say, well, okay, how ex what's your exertion for the two of you on here? And you go, oh, let's say it's a five, because you're, you're both moving and handing somebody, you're rolling them or bringing them up the bed or whatever. We then come in and we give you a new moving and handling plan. So let's say we use the hoist to do the turn. We've got a block in place. And we go, on there, for one of you to do that task, how did you find that now? Well, really, it should go down to a three or a two because you're not doing anything. The hoist is picking the, the person up, it's rolling, the block's in place. All you're doing is shifting and moving things around. So we've gone from 
uh, a five down to a three. So great, that's justifications for reducing a package. What we can't do is move up the exertion scale. So for example, there's two of you and you go, oh, well, at the moment it's hard and we drop you down to one and we go, now how do you find it? And you go, oh, it's a seven, it's really hard. Well, we can't do that, that that's obviously ridiculous. So we can use those ball scales to manipulate uh, the level of support that we're given. Now, what's also useful to know is we have the likely scale or the like it scale. Uh, and the like it scale is very much a similar thing, but for the service users, the individuals. And here we can just look at, well, okay, um, if we look at satisfaction between one and seven, um, at the moment, lifting your leg, um, you're using that dog lead. How satisfied are you? And you go, oh, well, I can do it, but I really don't like doing it. I, you know, maybe it's a two. I'm, I'm completely dissatisfied. So you're right, like it scale, two. Reason for this, reason for a moving and handling plan is to try and move that scale up to something they're satisfied with. So now let's say we use the leg strap on the hoist and the hoist lifts the leg up. Now how satisfied are you? Oh, actually that felt a lot better. Um, that's a six, great. So we can use the like it scale as well as a reasoning for moving or adjusting or changing a care plan, uh, or even keeping the care plan the same. So let's say, for example, we are already doing the next strap and uh, we go, right, how satisfied are you? And you go, well, I'm very satisfied. Why would we change that? Because if we changed it, it'd only go down. Um, so it's unlikely it's gonna go up uh, if you're at the top score. So we can use those scales. Now, obviously, on your reasoning, you would need to write which scale you're using and the rationale for it. So use like it scale because they're currently, things aren't quite right or currently um, everything's okay. Great. Hopefully that makes sense. Obviously when you try it, we'll, we'll let you know. So that's where we are with those scales. So it gives you an idea of the theory, the evidence-based practices that we can be using, okay? Um, so again, looking at their wishes, again, their wishes, you could use the like it scan in there um, and obviously making sure we have consent so we know who's got consent. Now, if this individual doesn't have consent, who's got the power of attorney? So is this a family member that has the power of attorney? That's gonna be really important to know. So let's move down a little bit more. Uh, and it says information about equipment required. So moving and handling techniques demonstrated to spouse and carers. So have you completed hoist competency assessments on carers and spouse um, equally and all the annual training, so all equipment. And don't forget you have all, you have access to those. So you've got your moving and handling assessment forms uh, there. So you've got, checklist there that you can use you've got your hoist competencies there so you've got different things that you can cover there with then it looks at additional information have you provided the individual with the sling checks and um the maintenance so the sling checks is making sure so if somebody has a sling in their house that we put up this sign so print it out laminate it and it just tells them and reminds the carers every time to check the sling before they use it so whilst we do a dynamic risk assessment every single time so what i mean by dynamic risk assessment we're checking the environment the task the load the equipment the environment and all of the other bits and pieces that we would normally do we should also be doing a sling check so it's there as a reminder uh, and again, if, if you're from Sutton, you've got uh, those numbers there. Um, so making sure that you've obviously you're giving the right information to the right people. And then finally, the maintenance. So a reminder about 
the equipment. So whether that's um, the hoist, the, the gantries, the molars, whatever it is, uh, equipment, well, um, you've got your steps for maintaining that equipment. So again, again, you can add additional notes there, but there, I've just put them on there as reminders to give that information to individuals, tick it off that you've given it and get it signed. Now, once you've completed all of this, it's then looking at you to make an overall assessment of the low, medium or high risk. So from the evidence provided, the patient's personal risk of movement handling is, and you're going to add that all up. So whatever the weighing of that is would be high, medium or low, and then we're going to sign that off. Now, when we look at the movement and handling plan, um, we're going to look at the tasks. So give it a task number and that task should relate to your um, your actual working practices. So if you're using an app, for example, um, the carers apps, they have tasks in there. So that might be task one. This example, task two, task three, task four, however you, you task yourselves. The number of staff required. So the number of staff required, you will have done your assessments for those wouldn't you because we've already talked about the bulk scores or the bulk scales um, and under the assessments you've got your um, single or double carers so those should have been completed so we know how many staff we need for those instructions we then got moving and hand instructions including sing, slings, loops, uh, and configurations. So for example, if you're using a hoist, make sure you're just saying hoist, sling, green, amber, red, whatever the color is. And then there, we just want some basic instructions for the carer on what to do. So again, they can be cut and paste and put into your online apps. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's quite simple to make some very personal centred um, instructions there. Uh, and, and you can get those from the SOP. So some basic steps uh, on what to do. Here, we need to make sure that we are listing the name of the equipment that's going to be used. So let's say you're using the Oxford hoist. We should have the serial number and the last date that was packed in, in, uh, tested so we know if it's electrical equipment it should be annually pack tested uh, and if you're looking at the slings um, obviously every time they use but a minimum of six months on the visual ones so here um, there's your six monthly sling examination forms so again they should be done so here if you've got a hoist you need to have the pack and then obviously somebody needs to make sure that they're doing the sling examination form uh, every six months. You know the risk because that's your FIM score. So you're just going to take that from above and pop the FIM score there. And then your SOP. So your SOP is your standard operating procedures and they're here. So again, all you're going to do is give it the SOP number. So, you know, if you're going to be doing, uh, I don't know, small aid from bed to chair, you're going to use SOP number five. And then you can just go in here and you can just personalise that for that individual um, just so they've got the right working procedures for them. Uh, and it's important to make sure that you update these as well. Um, so they need to be updated regularly. So again, here you can see this is um, a bed pull and single hand laid in and around the bed. Uh, and that was last updated in June 23. So the hop seven's out now. So just make sure when you go, go through your um, standard operating procedures that you just update those. So they are all up to date reflecting the new hop seven. Um, standards. So that's the HOP7 manual, which I talked about up here. No, down here. Sorry. So that's your HOP7. So you need your HOP7 to make sure that your SOPs are up to date and are correct. So you're going to put your SOP number in there. And then finally, you're just going to sign that off and pop a date in. 
And then you're going to do that for each task up here that you have assessed. And again, if you need, you know, if you've got other tasks there that you need to do, don't be afraid just to insert new rows uh, above or below because, you know, ultimately these are meant to be personal centered. So I would expect to see that they do look slightly different per individual. So again, if you need to add some more boxes on there, don't be afraid. Um, and again, you can just then link those further there and there. So that is how to complete a moving and handling assessment plan without you using your opinions, but using evidence-based clinical decision-making tools to remove that risk from you saying, I think it's this. And as evidence-based practitioners, that is exactly where we need to be. So I want to thank you for watching this. I appreciate that that was quite a lot of information. Um, what I want you to now do is I now want you to download the risk assessment form, this one. And I'd like you to complete that on an individual or a service user and then obviously email that back to me so I can uh, assess that for you to make sure that you're completing it properly. With regards to... Um, our health and safety risks and services to slings and all of this stuff and all this extra pieces here. Um, in here, I've given you a link there to download all the forms from there. So if you click on that link, it will take you to uh, that site. So you can then just download all of those forms. So you have access to all of that paperwork. So there's absolutely no excuse um, for you not to be using the right paperwork because the right paperwork will be in there. So we will keep updating that to make sure that that's um, contemporary and current. So the idea of the Move and Handling Champion is somebody that can manage this paperwork, manage and understand about the risks, the, the ways of working and the sharing of best practice. Uh, and that's exactly what I've done. Um, that's why we've done this. Uh, equally, I have developed um, a couple of booklets here. So if you want to know how to do uh, the home's risk assessments, you have that there. Um, so again, it just runs through kind of what this video is that I've just done for you. And if you wanted further information about the uh, fin bulk or like it uh, scales, uh, again, I've just given you a lot more detail there. So I'm hoping with the resources that I've given you, the video and the explanations, that should make it a lot clearer for you when completing these plans. Brilliant. Well, thanks for watching. I wish you all the best of luck and good luck with your assessments. Bye for now, everyone.